In the world of big tech, we often hear about billions of customers. Last year, for example, Apple crossed 1 billion active iPhone users. Similarly, Google also boasts 1 billion active users. But by far the biggest is Facebook, who has nearly 3 billion active users. Considering these mind-boggling numbers and the fact that these companies are basically ubiquitous, it's not surprising that these companies are valued in the trillions. But what does surprise me though are the background tech companies that the average person has never heard of. Such companies generally serve corporate customers and have little need to appeal to ordinary people. Yet, they boast market caps in the hundreds of billions. And one of the best examples of this is Salesforce. In 2017, Salesforce announced that they have more than 150,000 customers. Even if we assume that this number has grown to 200,000 customers, given that Salesforce is valued at $228 billion, each customer is worth well over a million dollars in terms of market cap. To put that in perspective, each Facebook customer is only worth $225 worth of market cap. And even each Apple customer is only worth $2,800 worth of market cap. So here's what Salesforce does and how they became one of the most lucrative businesses in the world. Taking a look back, the story of Salesforce dates back to a man named Mark Benioff who was born on September 25, 1964 in San Francisco, California. Mark's father owned a local department store in San Francisco which provided the family with a pretty comfortable life. But Mark's father refused to spoil Mark. He felt that Mark should work for everything he wanted. So when Mark wanted a computer as a teenager, his father told him to go get a job. Mark ended up being a janitor at a jewelry store. But unfortunately, this didn't last too long as Mark would be fired for using the wrong soap on the floors. Fortunately though, he was able to save up enough money to buy a computer. Most kids nowadays want a computer to play games, but Mark actually wanted a computer to develop games. Mark started off small by developing an application called How to Juggle which he would sell for $75. But once he saw this first paycheck, he would go all in on game development. At 15, he founded a one-man company called Liberty Software which developed games for the Atari 8-bit. Over the next year, he published dozens of games including Flapper, King Arthur's Hair, The Nightmare, Escape from Vulcan's Isle, and Crypt of the Undead. He worked with a company called Epix to bring his games to market, and by the time he was 16, he was earning $1,500 a month just from royalties. Adjusting for inflation, that's over $5,000 per month today. So Mark was basically making $60,000 per year as a 16-year-old. It's no wonder why this guy became a billionaire. Anyway, Mark ended up attending the University of Southern California where he majored in business administration. While completing his bachelor's, Mark took on internships as a programmer at Apple's Macintosh division. Mark enjoyed this experience and wanted to continue his journey as a programmer. But one of his university professors advised that customer-oriented work would be much more beneficial for Mark. So Mark got a sales job at Oracle after graduation. While sales was not Mark's area of expertise, he shined here as well. Just one year after joining, Mark was named Oracle's Rookie of the Year at age 23. And just three years after that, Mark became the youngest person in the company's history to become vice president. Considering the massive salaries of executives, Mark was able to become a millionaire by the time he was 25. Mark could have easily stayed at Oracle and possibly even worked his way up to CEO. But after 13 years at Oracle, he decided that he wanted to do something bigger. Mark felt that all software companies were approaching software incorrectly. They treated software as a product. Every few years, companies like Adobe and Microsoft came out with a new version of Windows or Photoshop. But Mark felt that it would be way better if these companies treated software as a service and constantly provided updates along the way. Given that this is basically what all software companies do today, Mark was clearly onto something. And in February of 1999, he would start trying to make this vision a reality by launching Salesforce. Mark didn't try to start Salesforce by himself though. He brought with them three Oracle veterans named Parker Harris, Dave Molinov, and Frank Dominguez. Initially, Larry Ellison, Oracle's founder, was extremely supportive of Mark starting his own business. In fact, he funded the startup with $2 million and even became a board member. But when he realized that Salesforce was also trying to compete against Oracle, Larry stopped helping Salesforce, but he did keep his stake. Now, that's all cool and all, but what exactly does Salesforce even do? Well, the bread and butter of Salesforce is Customer Relationship Management or CRM software. CRM software allows companies to aggregate all of their sales, marketing, and customer service data into one easy-to-use platform. This makes it much easier for companies to analyze their demographic in extreme detail. For example, what's your conversion rate? How many unique customers do you have? 
how many customers are repeat customers, how do sales vary with the age and location of your customers, and so on and so forth. Companies can then turn around and use this data to address shortfalls, single out certain demographics, and craft targeted marketing campaigns that are super effective. So basically, CRM software takes care of the logistics of managing customer data. Now, providing CRM solutions wasn't a new idea by any means. There were already plenty of large companies already providing CRM solutions like Oracle and Microsoft. But as we previously touched on, these guys were selling the software as a product. Customers had to buy the software every few years, install it onto their computers and servers, store all the data themselves, and troubleshoot many issues themselves. But with Salesforce, Salesforce will store the data, Salesforce will run the servers, and Salesforce will run the software. Customers simply had to use a web portal to access everything they need from anywhere in the world. The convenience and accessibility that Salesforce provided were unbeatable, but there were a few concerns. First of all, companies had to trust Salesforce with customer data. And secondly, this was not a one-time purchase, it was a subscription. But as more and more corporations switched over to Salesforce, companies had an easier time trusting Salesforce. But it wasn't all smooth sailing. Like all tech companies that were founded before 2000, Salesforce had to navigate the dot-com crash. And this was particularly rough given that Salesforce was an extremely young company when the bubble burst. To ease the financial stress on the company, Mark took Salesforce public in June of 2004 which allowed them to raise $110 million. This helped them survive the dot-com crash, but Mark knew that he had to diversify their income in order to better weather future recessions. One of Mark's first diversification efforts came in 2005 when Salesforce introduced AppExchange. As the name suggests, AppExchange was basically an app store but for businesses. Salesforce customers could download these apps, and Salesforce would split the revenue with the app developers. Now, this probably doesn't sound that crazy today, but keep in mind that this was years before the iPhone App Store. Another diversification effort from Salesforce came in 2009 with the launch of the Service Cloud. Similar to AppExchange, Service Cloud was another corporate application of an everyday service. If you have a technical question, one of the first things you'll probably do is Google it. But it's not so easy if you're a company and have a question about databases or servers. So with Service Cloud, Mark basically launched a Google slash Quora type service for corporations. Similarly, in 2011, Mark launched Chatter, which was a social collaboration service for companies. All these diversification efforts did help Salesforce's top line as revenue exploded from hundreds of millions to billions per year. But Salesforce's bottom line wasn't looking that great because Salesforce was reinvesting all of their profits into their employees and acquisitions. The acquisition part is self-explanatory, but for people who aren't familiar with Salesforce, they probably aren't aware of Salesforce's insane salaries. Software engineers, for example, earn anywhere between $182,000 to $754,000 per year. Similarly, managers earn anywhere between $248,000 to $1 million per year. At Salesforce, you can literally earn a 7-figure salary without being a C-suite executive. Considering these salaries, I don't think you'd be surprised to hear that Salesforce is the 9th highest paying company in the world. Aside from high salaries, Salesforce has one of the best workplaces in the world, with Salesforce boasting an A plus in terms of workplace culture. Even Apple only scores a B plus. This has earned Salesforce the title of second best place to work for in the world according to Fortune. Mark also ranks as the 15th most approved CEO in the US by employees. So clearly, Mark knew what he was doing and turning a profit simply wasn't a priority for him. He wanted to get Salesforce's holdings, diversification, and employees to a certain level of satisfaction before focusing on profits. And in 2016, this time had finally come. And ever since then, Salesforce has not only been pulling in billions every year, but keeping billions. Today, Salesforce serves 90% of the Fortune 500, including everyone from Apple and Facebook to Walmart and MasterCard. And given that each of these guys pays Salesforce millions of dollars per year, if not tens of millions for their services, it's not surprising that Salesforce pulled in $25 billion in revenue in the most recent 12-month period. Aside from being a giant within the corporate world, Salesforce practices what Mark calls the 1-1-1 philanthropy model. Every year, Salesforce dedicates 1% of the company's equity, 1% of their products, and 1% of their employees' time to philanthropic efforts. So far, Salesforce has given their software to 46,000 nonprofits and NGOs for free or at a discount, and their employees have volunteered for a total of 4.9 million hours. As for Mark, he only owns a modest 3-4% of the company, but given the size of Salesforce, that itself translates to $9 billion. Mark of course enjoys his wealth by splurging on toys like mansions and cars, but Mark also donates significant amounts of his wealth. 
he's a very large proponent of taking action against climate change. In fact, just a couple of months ago, he donated $300 million to fight climate change. $200 million of this came from Mark himself, and $100 million came from Salesforce. Also, do you guys remember the Team Freeze effort from Mr. Beast a couple of years ago? Mr. Beast was able to raise a total of $23 million, which translates to 23 million trees being planted. There were some high-profile figures who donated to Team Trees, one of them being Mark who donated $900,000. Not only did Mark donate to Team Trees, but he went ahead and launched his own tree planting foundation called 1T.org. As the name suggests, the goal of the foundation is to plant 1 trillion trees by 2050. And given the connections that Mark has, he has been able to get over 300 companies on board. So hopefully, this vision does become a reality. But we'll just have to wait and see. Do you guys think Mark can plant 1 trillion trees? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you hope Mark succeeds. And of course, consider checking out our international channels to watch our videos in other languages. And consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.